All right, guys, gals, and non-binary pals, we have a lot to cover today, so we're just going to get right into it. I've seen a fair few comments out there from folks who don't seem to have like the basic argo to properly engage with mech shows and the criticism they're in, so it looks like we're going to have to build some foundations. So, if you have already been through this particular class, well, I'm sorry. Uh, looks like you're saddled with the dummies again. But uh, that's what a 101 class is for. So, let's start with what is mecha, okay? As far as the genre is concerned, a mecha is any sort of piloted robot, and they are usually substantially larger than a human. If it's person-sized, then it's probably powered armor, not a proper mecha. The piloting system doesn't necessarily have to be inside the robot, like in Tetsujin 28, where the control device is a remote control box. Generally speaking, if you can cut away to your main pilot sitting in a cockpit, it's a mecha, not power armor. Iron Man's armor is power armor. The Hulkbuster is a mecha. The hard suits from Bubblegum Crisis are power armor. The moto slave that Pris rides in is a mecha. Paragon war suits are mecha. The pilots are wearing power armor. Do we understand this? Can we all be on the same page? Okay, great. So the first proper mecha anime was 1963's Tetsujin 28, which got turned into Gigantor in the United States. Tetsujin 28 had World War II in its DNA, as it was created originally to take the fight directly to the United States, but got mothballed because the war ended. Given it was a super weapon, a lot of people wanted to get their mitts on it, but it ended up in the hands of Shitaro Kaneda, who was a kid detective. The main conceit of Tetsujin 28 is that technology is neither good nor bad, but it is entirely dependent on the wielder. So, considering that Japan at the time was undergoing a reconstruction period, in the U.S. occupation, when the manga was originally written, modern, westernized technology was looked at with suspicion. Having this message in an extremely popular show that literally every child was watching helped swing this nascent culture war towards modernization. Tetsujin 28, for whatever else it may be, is also in the subgenre of super robot, though at the time it was made it was just a robot show. Super Robots are, generally speaking, formulaic Monster of the Week series following in line with its codifier, 1972's Mazinger Z. Mazinger Z followed on from the ideas of Tessigen 28 with the idea that, again, technology can make you either a god or a devil, but it's entirely dependent on who's using it. The bad guy in this is Dr. Hell, by the way, if you're not clear on who the hero is. Mazinger Z is also the first properly piloted giant robot as opposed to Tetsujin being remote controlled. Originally, the idea was going to have a motorcycle that drove into the back of Mazinger's head, but this was scrapped as a derivative after the popularity of Kamen Rider that same year. Instead, Koji Kabuto pilots Mazinger Z from a head-mounted Pilder hovercraft that also doubles as an escape pod. And, while we're on the topic of Big First, the First Lady of Mecha pilots is also featured in this show in the form of Sayaka Yumi, who, in spite of being a more sensible pilot than the brash Koji, is saddled with an inferior mecha that shoots teddy missiles. Look, it was 1972, nothing's perfect, alright? Following on from this is Ken Ishikawa's Get a Robo, which featured the first combining robot. Get a Robo took cues from shows like Gachaman and Cyborg 009 in that the pilots more often than not were conflicted with each other, often very violently. In addition to this, the monsters of the week that they fought were part of the Dinosaur Empire, which meant that they had a tendency to bleed and spurt when they got hit with drills and axes. Super Robots continued almost entirely unchallenged for most of the decade, though many directors did take their turns at attempting to shift the genre to a slightly more grounded form. Now, as I outlined in my prior video on what makes a good mecha show, Super Robots are episodic by nature, and for the most part, are Monster of the Week shows. They are concerned with what are called primal fears as their driving story element, which are basic ideas like monsters, pain, fear, and death. They're problems that can be solved with a direct, often fist-shaped solution. The story will take place in and around the Monster of the Week, and characterization is going to be kind of a separate consideration. 
Super Robots would find a more permanent housing in the nascent Super Sentai series towards the end of the 70s, and while they crop up regularly even in present day, they would only move so far out of these boundaries. Generally speaking, Super Robots are aimed at children because of all the add-ons and all the toys. Buy all our play sets and toys! Weekdays at 4.30. In 1979, Yoshiyuki Tamino and his crew, fresh off of the surprisingly dark Daitarn 3 and Zambot 3, found success in their latest outing called Mobile Suit Gundam. Mobile Suit Gundam would feature mecha as war machines rather than an oversized superhero, and the villains were normal humans rather than cyborgs, mechanical monsters, alien dinosaurs, dinosaurs, aliens, or otherwise. Amuro Ray, far from a hot-blooded badass, was a bookish, introverted teenager thrust into a war that he barely understood or cared about. Likewise, the white base, crewed by a barely trained and hopelessly outnumbered group of refugees, was under constant attack by the Xeon, and the incompetent Federation forces that they were supposed to be allied with could barely lift a finger to assist them. Now, by modern standards, the Gundam itself is very super robot, but at this time frame, the maintenance aspects and the constant pressure was enough to set it apart. The real robot style. Even with all of the conceits and caveats of modern Gundam being kind of super robot-esque, they're still more grounded in reality than your typical super robot show, and let me explain why. The real robot style, typified by Gundam's exploration of child soldiers, political intrigue, and everything else that it came along, deals with what are called civilized or adult fears. These are fears that stem more from a loss of control, a loss of innocence, and the sensation of being against a world that aggressively hates or aggressively disregards your personal needs and well-being. There are no simple solutions to the adult fears. And, well, yes, you can lash out against them. It won't fix the problem, and if anything, it's likely to make it worse. While violence and warfare are also a large part of the real robot style, they are not the grand solution to the overarching story. Real robot series tend to be serialized as opposed to being episodic. After Gundam made its mark, the 80s would be filled with shows trying to do similar things, and storytelling and mecha advanced greatly. This would bring in more mature audiences with disposable income to buy model kits, which would greatly assist in Gundam's ascent to the top of the mecha heap. Super Robots and Real Robots are two very, very different genres to work in, and while elements of both crop up in lots of series by this point, it's still very important to understand the delineation to adequately grasp the state of the mecha genre and to grapple with whatever work you happen to be looking at at the time. So with this in mind, by the time the 90s rolled around, Mecha was getting mashed up and mixed up with whatever they could get their hands on. Primarily, they were getting iterated into fantasy and magical girl spaces, which were primarily the realm of shoujo authors, though other series would actively court different audiences. Directors branched out from the typical style of storytelling and worked to examine what Mecha could do as a literary vehicle instead of just a regular vehicle. Shows like Nadesco, Evangelion and its derivatives, Ray Earth, Escaflone, and the like all advance the genre steadily, pulling in disparate aspects to great effect. As such, we refer generally to the 90s as a fusion era. Now, generally speaking, the 2000s were less great for new mecha series, and the majority of the series that did come out were reboots or reimagining of more classic series. This is due in part to the fact that a large amount of people who were entering the anime industry for the first time were remembering the shows that they enjoyed, but perhaps didn't quite have a handle on what made those shows good. We refer to this as the inmates running the asylum problem. Tetsujin 28, Gundam, Getter, a lot of old series got a fresh coat of paint. And while shows like Code Geass expanded the genre out, it was working against the clock as the expansive mecha shows started to make the genre buckle in the face of easier to produce and more financially viable series. So in the interim, mecha went full only fans in the 2010s, relying on fan service to get series made. Not a fan myself, but there are some very specific reasons for that. At any rate, when 
things get described with super robot or real robot in video essays and in general parlance, it's more specifically what's meant by those terms. You can probably make a valid claim about the style of robot show any particular series is by the amount of yelling versus the amount of crying that the main pilots do. But it's not a perfect system. The point being, this is the nomenclature that mecha fans will use to try and categorize shows that have similar aspects. Just like we group animals into families and phylums and genuses, that's what the words are there for, for the most part. It's not a judgment on quality, but there are a lot of things that fans of one type of show tend not to enjoy in the opposite genre, and that's just a fact of life, for good or for ill. So, to recap, because... All good lessons end with a recap of what we learned. Super robots deal with primal fears. Real robots deal with adult fears. And by this point in the genre's life, there's lots of overlap and differences. However, you can still, generally speaking, divide them up into these very broad categories. And before you ask, yes, this will all be on the final, so you better study up. Anyway, class dismissed. We'll see you next time. That being said, this is Professor Otaku, the greatest American anime critic, signing off.